I can start us off if you want. Yeah, man, do it. I'm okay. Ready. I'm ready. Don't think I'm not ready. Wait, I'm, I'm ready. ready. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Well, are you ready? PCFM Army, welcome to another episode of the Pop Culture Field Manual Podcast, sitting right at that intersection of weapons, action, the military, and pop culture. We have a very accurate and fun-filled episode in store for you folks and uh if you've worked a job where there was a movie or a tv show that was featured in this piece of cinema or pop culture i guarantee you that you would find something that was misleading inaccurate or possibly spot on about it and there is no shortage of military movies or tv that feature our service members deployed overseas but how much of what is portrayed is actually accurate? And that is exactly what we're going to talk about today. And based on our own experiences, Israel and I's experiences overseas, we're going to discuss some great and not so great portrayals of deployment. Yes. Yes, that is what is going to happen. Uh, this is one of those, uh, this is a kind of like a classic uh, question, I think, that you and I have gotten What's the in the past. Like? Yeah, what's deployment like? Yeah, what's it like in your deployment? What was the what was the best? What was the worst? What was the scariest? What was the, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever. Uh, and then of course for for if you don't know when movies now you are know. released, now you know. Now you if know. you don't know, now you know. <laughs> per, per, Sorry, person. <laughs> Great opportunity there. But no, not you, Siri. Uh, the more and I, and I'm sure we're gonna see more movies come out. Uh, uh, as you know, now that, uh, kind of our major involvement in our, our major involvements around the world have kind of wound down, even yeah. though we're, we're always everywhere, I feel like, sure. um, but, uh, like, is it real? Like, is that what it's like? You know sure. What I, mean? I, I think it's a great question. Um, but I think it's worth noting that a lot of these pieces of pop culture, like, I mean, great representations of combat, you know, we have saving private Ryan, yeah. we have, uh, Black Hawk Down, um, et cetera, et cetera. All, all these quiet on the that, Western Front recently. Oh, yeah. 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 Like all these movies that are portraying like harsh and accurate combat are typically involving one event. Or like, you know, Hamburger Hill was like one of the most violent movies I've ever seen that portray, you know, uh, military army in Vietnam or Marines in Vietnam. And uh, like that was one event. You mm -hmm. know, so there are some people that deployed to Vietnam that didn't see anything. Right. And there's some right. people that deployed and got to see it all. Yeah. You know, so like uh, when when I feel like civilians go to the movies and watch these movies portrayed about, you know, very, very specific events in a very, very large conflict, um, you know, sometimes they get the wrong message um, because, you know, I've been, quote unquote, deployed. And like, you know, I got to spend a little bit of time in Iraq and Iraq was like a vacation to me. And I know I barely talk about it because I spent like two weeks there. And to ah, me, that doesn't count. It yeah. doesn't count at all, you know, uh, because we were literally staying in Erbil and like Erbil is its own city. Yeah, you man. Know? The military base is so big yeah. that uh, you get, you know, I heard the little rocket alarm go off, but like that's if there's a rocket landing, like, you know, maybe two miles away, they still play it. <laughs> and uh, it's like they have Burger Kings, they have shopping malls, they have bazaars, they have all this stuff. They have bars on the base. Like, yeah. you're so safe. It's like vacation. It's like going to Kuwait. Yeah. Um, but like a lot of people, you know, they hear the word deployment and then they think like, oh, you are in the shit, which sometimes you are and sometimes you're not. And it really depends on where you're going and who you're going with. Yeah, especially with something like Iraq and Afghanistan, especially Afghanistan, because we were there for 20 plus years, which about 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, I was deployed to Afghanistan. I was deployed to Afghanistan in 2001 versus 2017, yeah. you know, and I was with this unit versus that unit. I was out there with special forces or I was on the base with mechanics or truck yeah. drivers, you know. Yeah. Uh, I was a private contractor, uh, all those kinds of things. All that stuff factors into... Uh, 
into your what kind of deployment you're going to have. And and then also we can talk about this. You and I have both had chill deployments. I'm yeah. going to go I'll go to Korea for a couple of weeks for uh, and uh, 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 an it's Army almost weird calling them deployments. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. It says yeah. on your you pull out your military document. It says deployment and it says like, you know, Korea four months. Yeah. But like personally and i think this is just a mental bias that was like programmed in my mind where it was like uh you know especially for an infantryman it's like you are not deployed unless you are in a combat zone right. that is that is the military bias and when you right. call like you know in 2016 20, was it 20 2016 2016 i think it was 2016 2016 got the call you're going to south korea you know, for a for a quote unquote deployment, I was like, yeah. this isn't a deployment. Yeah, like this is we started making up words and names for it because it's it's not a deployment. It's an overseas training rotation, you know, but it <laughs> happened to be the same duration of a deployment. And I was like, OK, well, what do you call this? So, you know, when people ask me how many times I deployed, I say only once. Because I went to combat zone, you know, I went to a combat zone one time, but I went to Korea, I went to Germany, I went to, you know, I went to all these <laughs> different right. countries. I just didn't count it. Yeah, you know? that was something yeah. I don't know. Did, you tell me if this was a conversation that you heard or something that the leadership was trying to curve, but there was a problem, I think, maybe coming into the time when I was in the military, but uh, they called it military tourism. You know, where you would do something like, oh, we got to deploy. We got to go to Cambodia for six weeks to do some yeah. training stuff. When 50 percent of the time you're not you're not doing anything. You're out at the bars. You're hanging out. Yeah, you're, you know, you're doing your thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the but brass is like, no, we, we're not going to. That's fraud, waste and abuse. We don't want to do that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, military so, tourism. Yeah, yeah, no, I never heard <laughs> that term, um, but it is 100 percent true. It's like you have to justify it. I mean, literally what we did in korea and then i spent like a month in germany and like what we did in these countries we could have easily did back at base just like we did during our training cycles um yeah i think they just you know we i started seeing uh uh the war slowly coming to an end and you know mm -hmm. I, I i got so lucky and i say lucky some people are like well you're calling lucky i got so lucky to catch the ass end of the GWAT to like get a little action right yes not the yeah. action that i wanted not the action i saw on the movies not the shit that i wanted to be in you know that yeah. i prepared myself for yeah um but i still you know looking back on it and i tell these stories and i'm like oh i didn't get to do what i wanted to do but i got to do you know got to saw arms off and you know i got to shoot mortars at people and you know and that's cool and you know telling a normal person that was like whoa but you know, hearing <laughs> me hearing that, I'm like, <laughs> what a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do your job on a basic yeah. level. For those that, yeah, anybody out there thinking that Cameron's like a psychopath, you, we train Rangers and Special Forces. We train to do a certain kind of job and you want to do your job, man. You want yeah. to do what you train to do, what you get pumped up to do, and what you, yeah. you and your buddies, you become this molded, this formation and this, this, uh, you get the you get the synergy right. You're with your buddies. You're yeah. training, and you want to do that for real. Yeah, you no, know? I put myself. You know, what's the point of putting yeah. yourself through literal hell, like going through selections? You know, putting yourself through the torment that is being a private in the 75th Range Regiment to not be <laughs> able to get to, and do what they're telling you you're going to do. That's that to me breed. That's psychopath. That will breed a psychopath. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like basically putting a pit bull in a cage and just poking it with a stick and telling it you're going to let it out and then yeah. you never let it out. Yeah. Um yeah. but uh but yeah, no, it's it's you know I, I I'm very fortunate to catch the ass end cuz nowadays you typically don't there's not a lot of guys left with a lot of experience. You know, you're, I'm starting to see it dwindling. And, you know, yeah. I, you saw it dwindling. Like, I was so lucky to, you know, to me, you know, in the Ranger Regiment, when you see, like, a seasoned guy, they have, you know, they have deployment, they have, a, they have a deployment, and they have their combat action badge. And that's, like, everybody had that. And if you, don't, if you didn't have that, it was kind of like you were an outlier. And yeah. I was so lucky to get that. Like mm. people were going on deployment and coming back without a combat action badge. And that literally just means you were engaged in combat and you fired back or you were fired at like there's criteria to yeah. get that. So people, even if you're, you know, you go overseas and a mortar lands way far away from you, you're not going to get that. You know, some people get it if it's a little closer. Um, I got it from just shooting mortars at the enemy, like, you know, 
that wasn't to me it wasn't like being in a full fledged firefight but that's the reason i got mine but yep. like coming back with that was just such a relief because i feel like i was complete you know yeah like i've completed the circle i found all the five pieces of exodia and I'm like <laughs> but nowadays you know there's rangers that don't have them and it's you know, I, I feel really bad because that's what they they probably want that. Yeah, um, they like, you know, they want that so bad because uh, that's what all the leaders have in it. You know, that's what all the older guys have. So yeah. they want that. And then not to mention, like, you know, when I'm on Instagram and I you know sometimes on my explore page pops up like the recent graduation classes of the new drill sergeants, you know, that are going to be taking over the basic training and training the next generation of war fighters. And, you know. I would argue 80 percent of these people don't even have a deployment mm, you know 80 mm -hmm. percent of them don't have actual operational experience yeah and that's like there's a, yeah that's an interesting conversation to have right now especially because it's a weird kind of thing you because you want to have leadership that has the that have those experiences yeah. And yet at the same time, what does that say? It's like, well, we got to have a war for in order for those yeah. experiences to be available to be had. And we're coming into a time right now where it, it, it's nobody, uh, you know, nobody wants it's peace time. It's peace time. Yeah. And I was yeah. Gonna say, nobody wants to have like a massive war going on. Like I'm sure the Ukrainians and the Russians are not having a good time with all yeah, this no. stuff. But uh, but for America specifically, it's like it's like working out. You have to keep working out in order to stay fit. Yeah. And how are we going to keep America's army, America's military fit and ready? Because it's going to happen again, right? It War will. is inevitable. It's the it's the one thing that we have uh, had throughout entire human history since Cain yeah. killed Abel. We've been, we've fighting. been fighting each other. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to happen again. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, um, well, yeah. How are we going to get ready, man? Because we got to stay ready because if we get complacent, man, I'm telling you, as as hard as it would be once a war starts with a ready force, it's going to be that much harder if a war starts with an unready force. And we're going to be caught off guard and then more soldiers are going to die. And yeah. as a result, because we're not ready for it. And so it's really interesting. You talk about the drill sergeants. And, and, you know, we, we know that there's principles, right? We know that there's military principles that we can still train and still keep sharp. Yeah. But, um, it's just, it's just going to be different because there's not going to be like, listen, you guys, you got to pay attention to your training because in six months you're going to be in Iraq in six months. You're going to yeah. be in Afghanistan. You yeah. Know? I know. I just, you know, I compare it to my experiences. Uh, just like when I went through, you know, in the ACU days, just like you did. No, you were the, I'm sorry, you were the Woodland days, right? I mean, Woodland transitioning into ACUs. I was the yeah. last Woodland, uh, or did we have eight? No, we did. We got Woodland in basic training. Yep. And yeah. I was the last I class to get issued uh, black boots that you had to clean and shine yeah. every day. <laughs> That's crazy. Man. That's, cra <laughs> That's crazy. Old man. But no, I remember like, you know, on the day having daily conversations or I'm sorry, not conversations. I would say more dialogue with my drill sergeants who were all combat experienced infantrymen. Hmm. Like not a single one of them didn't have a deployment. Like every single one deployed, every single one had a CIB. So they were training you to, for what to expect because of their experiences. So now I don't, you know, I don't know how it's going to work with uh, the new generation and not getting that. But that's a conversation for a little different episode because we're here yeah, to talk about deployments, though. actual deployments. Yeah, there you go. Actual deployments. But uh, you know. I feel like everyone, especially in the movies, I haven't seen, you know, maybe a lot of these deployments have these guys roughing it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you know, you know what? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Right. Right. Yeah. When you talk about the, like, like just the most recent one that you and I have seen, because we did a did our Patreon live stream a couple of months ago with this one. But the outpost. Right. Yeah. That was like that's roughing it to me. Not only is that roughing it in terms of accommodations, your circumstances, but the fact that they were in such a strategically stupid position to be in and yeah. the kind of stress that that would put on somebody, uh, sure, that, just... that was never my experience when I was on deployment to yeah. Iraq. Yeah, no, in my experience, you know, I would say the level of roughing it as they did was what we were doing. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. But like, as far as a strategic positioning, I mean, we were pretty damn close to the flot. Like I could literally see, uh, the ISIS headquarters from our, from our building. Like we, uh, um, so that, that was really interesting. Cause we'd sit on the rooftop and like, you know, the enemy's right there. They're less than like a K away. And like you would hear gunfire, you would see the bombs being dropped. You would like literally if you had a sniper scope uh, or any type of glass, there was a soccer stadium in the distance, like a huge stadium that you could see. And you would look at, you know how usually stadiums have like ginormous flags and yeah. they had this like 80 by 50 foot ISIS flag. And it <laughs> would you could see it through your scope. Actually, really story, really cool story about that, too, um, was uh at the end of our deployment there, like we were getting ready to move over to, uh, I think it was Hasaka, which was on the other side of the country by Adifa Dam. And uh, we were right outside of Raqqa, Raqqa. And uh, one day, like we, we cleared ISIS out, like we did it. It was like there was celebration in the streets. I remember we thought we were about to get invaded by the Mongolian horde. Cause like <laughs> one day we were all sitting and I forgot what movie we were watching, but we were all like sitting there watching this movie and we just hear like a barrage of gunfire, like like a shocking amount from this deployment. <laughs> so everyone, you know, classic, uh, we run up. I'm in Ranger panties and a tank top with a plate carrier and a helmet on. And all I remember <laughs> is our rooftop had like, we had two Mark 19s. We had two 50 cows. We had all of our 240s we had law rockets like lined up against just to be ready to, we had a, like three buckets full of frag grenades just like at each point like each <laughs> corner like we had every single gun like up there so we all run up to the rooftop and i get on a 50 cal and i like basically set it up and we have all the fancy 50 cal so it had like an eotech mounted on it it had slack rounds which are rounds that literally explode when they hit and like we see this like convoy coming down this main msr which is like a couple hundred meters away from our rooftop and an msr for those of you that aren't military acronym savvy is the main supply route and like it's pretty much just like a, a pretty notable road mm -hmm. and pretty much we just see like this convoy vehicles with guys in the back like with all ak's and everything and they're too far to like confirm but like we were about to unleash like that was it that was the moment where we're all like this is we're you can you're we're gonna write books about this. <laughs> if we were navy we would be like if we were navy seals this is what we're gonna write books about. and like i remember i'm just like tracking this vehicle with my 50 cal and like my safety's off and my thumbs are on the little paddles and i'm like here we go this is what you wanted cam you're about to get it you're about to get it and then all of a sudden like uh because they're firing they're fucking shooting and yeah. uh and we had a guy run up and he's like, no, 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 don't hit them. Those are our guys. They're just celebrating because they defeated ISIS. And we're like, oh, my God. Like, yeah. dude. Those guys will never know how close they came. Yeah, how to close they came to death. Absolute death. <laughs> we're talking hundreds of guys. Um, but uh, so we had that happen. And uh, so they're celebrating. And, you know, the next couple of days, they're like basically kind of scrubbing the city. And uh, we they had this van pull up beside our compound and like we could look down and like see the street and like this van pull and started like pushing out potato sacks kind of looking thing like burlap sacks. And then they throw out this giant one and we're like, what the heck is that? We're all like looking down and seeing what it is. And uh, he opens it and starts pulling out this like black curtain, like huge uh... black curtain. And all of a sudden, he like pulls out a big piece of it, opens it, and it's the flag that they've been <laughs> flying at this soccer stadium. That that ginormous ISIS flag, their HQ flag. Yeah. He just pulls it out. And I see it, and my squad leader sees it, and we look at each other, and we're like, that's ours. So we literally... <laughs> we, we're sprinting down the stairs like flip flops fucking you know every we're, and we just sprint outside i like i grab my glock because like we're trying to get this flag and we're going outside the gate yeah. <laughs> to get this thing and somehow we negotiated it from him and wow. we traded him some stuff and like 
now that ISIS flag is hanging above my platoon's like cage in Washington. Uh, so that's awesome. that was super cool. But like, uh, I mean, but moments like that, you know, you're talking, you're talking about them and like that, those are cool moments. Yeah. Uh, except for the con, you know, but I wanted the combat, but now I'm perfectly okay with like yeah. that deployment. Yeah. But, uh, well, then that seems a lot like, I feel like everybody can relate to Jarhead. Like you've seen yeah. Jarhead, right? Of course. I think it's feeling... one of the most accurate military deployment movies <laughs> ever. It is. It's the feeling of training up to do something and almost, but not quite ever getting a chance to do it. And like, yeah. also like the boredom that can set in when you are out on deployment and you know, we've all experienced it to some extent, those of us that have been deployed of like just hanging out. I, I was lucky because I had very nice accommodations up in Mosul. I had my own room. We had our own internet. Uh, we had a gym right down the hallway. And when we weren't doing operations, we were just working out and eating. And then I was yeah. like watching, I was watching DVDs on my on my lap my little janky laptop and that's yeah. it man reading books chilling out there was no schedule unless you had to pull radio duty uh we had a rotating schedule for that yeah, for the jock yeah the yeah. jock rto or something exactly like that. yeah so um so that that was it you'd go down to the little our our headquarters we had a compound within the mosul base so we had our own yeah. compound within a compound which was awesome um you go over, You we had a, a table right in the entrance of the hallway to our headquarters that had everything that people would send to us. So we, you'd go and check out a couple letters from some elementary school kids in Iowa. Yeah. You could get some Girl <laughs> yeah. Scout cookies. You could get some candy. They sent care packages. If you needed an extra toothbrush and a bar of soap, you could go down. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, we get that stuff when you're over there. So if you ever yeah, you do overseas, we all, we all get that stuff. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was what it was like when we weren't doing anything. But I can't imagine being in like a regular infantry line unit or some other job where your your job is dependent upon maybe somebody else making a decision and you yeah. can't move until they move a lot of times uh in sf we would be putting our own stuff together we would get we had our own intel resources we had our own people feeding us stuff and uh and then we could put together packages ourselves and and then there'd be the odd uh there'd be the odd job to do. Like I got to do a quick round about, uh, in a black Hawk, just me and the pilots and the gunner. But I had to go and give the, uh, the new, um, crypto to everybody when we're doing a switch over. Yeah. yeah. I had to go and they, their, their, their echo would meet me on the pad and I'd yeah. hook up to their guy. We transfer the crypto and I, then I'd leave. So that was like yeah. all night. That was like a couple hours. I'd fly it everywhere. So that was kind of fun and cool. And yeah. just looking out at the night, the night sky. So I can't say that there were many, parts where i was like bored bored but there you're is that busy. feeling you're yeah. always yeah you're always doing yeah right and of course if you're in a good unit there's always something to do there's training to do yeah uh, uh especially we'd go out to the range and stuff but uh when it comes to the jarhead type of of boredom i felt that right in like the middle of my deployment because we were out in iraq for nine months yeah and right around june july august you'd feel it it's it's like you're not you are you're settled in, but you're not leaving. You're not getting ready to leave yet because everything takes time to settle in and then to get ready to leave. All takes time. Yeah. So there's this energy that you feel when you're coming into the country and then when you're getting ready to leave. That's like all right, we're getting ready to get out of here. But there's that middle period where if you're not doing something, you're like and I and I and I'll be honest, uh, Cam, you you've spoken about it, and so I feel the freedom to speak about my you know like my desires. It's like. I, I got a CIB too, man, but that was, I was driving in the convoy yeah. when we got attacked, you know? And so I never actually technically fired back. I never fired my weapon in a combat situation while yeah. I was in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and something about that bothers me, man. I really it, wanted to do the <laughs> thing, man, you yeah. know, cause I did it yeah. so much in training and it's like, I just wish I would have just, just capped this like one. Yeah. One insurgent, you know, one yeah, just yeah, one Iranian officer or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Just to make the grass grow a little bit. So um I appreciate that you you talk about that because no, there's no place better to do your job to do that kind of job where it's permissible and morally right to do so than in a combat yeah. deployment. And I missed no, out on it. <laughs> absolutely. No, I you're not I feel like you're not alone because there's a lot of guys I talk to that, you know, have that same experience. Um, and you know, like it's to me, it's I could say getting lucky because there are 
like the amount of people that have actually gotten that like you know kick in a door and shoot people in the face experience mm -hmm. that even in the rangers is f slim you know because yeah. only one person takes that shot you know yeah. even if you're on the on the ground with them you'll get that cib but like only one person in that group of 36 guys actually took that shot you know what yeah. i'm saying yeah so like you know it's you know, there's a lot of guys that do just because Rangers were so busy, but like there's a lot of guys that don't. Um, and I struggled with that coming home because like in my experience, like even though I was shooting mortars, like allegedly, quote unquote, like, you know, allegedly I got, you know, the my mortars hit where they were supposed to. <laughs> and like because we had a Raven getting like live BDA battle damage assessment feedback. So like my mortars hit where they exactly where they were supposed to. And, you know. When I brought that up to my squad leader, he's like, I was pretty jazzed about it because I was like, oh, dude. But it was it was weird because like you don't see it, you know, you're just yeah. like if someone presents you a button, a, a stranger comes up to you and has like one of those that was easy buttons. Yeah. And he's like, hey, <laughs> press this button and somebody dies and you just start <laughs> smashing the button like you don't know where, you know, yeah. you know, it's just like you don't know where. So like I was pretty jazzed, but my squad leader was like. It doesn't fucking count unless you get to play with the dead body. And I'm like, well, Aww. you just you just ruined my day. Um, <laughs> but uh, so like for me, it's like those that experience since I didn't get to see it with my own eyes. It's kind of like like I didn't do it. Um, but, yeah. I, you know, it took a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy to get over that. Uh, <laughs> That's what you had to go to therapy for. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I just I, I took another human life and I don't know yeah. how to do no. it. With it. it was, I took saying, a life and I didn't get the fucking say, yeah. shit. <laughs> not to say yeah. that people don't need it. Hey, if it's bothering yeah. you, you got to go see somebody. But yeah, go talk to people. There are the rest of us that relish the opportunity. So. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, I mean, experiences like that are what, you know, made me who I am today. Um, but uh, yeah, just thinking about that deployment, though, like comparing it to, uh, you know, you said you had your own camp within yeah. the, in Mosul, right? Yeah. And yep. Rangers and Bath, I'm pretty sure they have Camp Alpha, which is like fenced off from the rest, too. And that's where they operate out of. Yeah. Um, but like the differences between like special operation deployments and like conventional forces. Yeah. I think it's hugely, it's largely uh, leadership dependent, I feel Ooh. like. Oh, man. Oh, man. So much, how, though. Yeah. What those guys are allowed to do, how they're allowed to dress, how they're allowed to act, yeah. think, feel is all leadership dependent. I don't yeah. know, because I have a story for you for mine. Go for it. Um, like, uh, pretty much, I felt so we were there, we were in Al Raqqa, we call it a uh, Firebase Raqqa. And uh, it was essentially just a three-story abandoned schoolhouse. It wasn't an actual base. It was just a school that we seized from ISIS. And, like, it was super small, had, like, a tiny wall that surrounded it. It was, like, maybe 400 meters all the way around. And uh, it was like a track. It was, like, literally a track from a football field. And uh, essentially, we, you know, we had a bunch of forces with us. And... Uh, about two and a half months into that deployment, a platoon from 10th Mountain Division, a regular infantry platoon, just showed up out of nowhere. And like we were, the 75th Ranger Regiment was the lowest on the totem pole while we were there. That's how really? many, that's how, that's how special, that's how many special units were here. Golly. Like, and we were tier two. So everybody else was tier one, except for an SF group. Hmm. Um, so it was us, SF, Delta, French, uh, French, uh, like French special reconnaissance, which is their tier one. And then like, uh, and then a platoon of SAS guys. And like, we were the lowest on the totem pole. So like we pulled security for the place and kept that place running. And so out of nowhere, this group from 10th mountain division shows up and we're like, who the fuck are you guys? Man? <laughs> you didn't know they were coming. No, no. One day they just showed up and like we had full beards, like we were rocking <laughs> around and and in like ranger panties and, you know, tank tops and flip flops and shit. And like these guys showed up and they was just a platoon in their first. I felt so bad for them because like we had we were pretty much all free, you know, and uh, we were doing everything. And like we had outside showers from the school. So you had to walk down the you walk down the stairs and then you had to go outside and there was these just this mud hut that had a tank on top that was like not heated and it just would run down and you would have this hose that came into a shower head 
And like, if you showered in the middle of the day, you were good because it was hot. But at nighttime, oh, okay. it was fucking cold. And there was no lights in there, too. So you had the shower with a headlamp on. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> so like, I would see these guys, poor bastards. They had to dress. They couldn't wear civilian clothes like the rest of us. They had to dress in Army PT uniforms. And they weren't allowed to walk. And this is all from their first sergeant. You know, Did they have PT guy. belts? Did they have to wear two PT belts as well? No, not okay. that bad. Uh, but they had to. They weren't allowed to walk to the restrooms in flip flops or shower shoes. They had to wear running shoes into the bathroom, change into their shower shoes, shower, oh and then when God. they wanted to walk back up, they had to put their peat and said, "Like we would walk up in towels, you know." Just yeah. Sh- yeah. There was a couple women, but they were, you know. The women on deployment, they don't give a shit, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, so we'd walk up shirtless with like, you know, towels on and flip flops. And these guys, poor bastards, had to like, you know, change into full PTs again, wet, put running sneakers on and walk up to their room and then, you know, change. And I'm like, dude, Gee whiz. just because one guy, you know, is like, we got to yeah. do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some officer has it into his head, whether it's a power trip or they have some old notion of what is proper it just like it's not practical it's not yeah. circumstantially appropriate yeah it's just no we have to do it because because i say we have to do it yeah that's why generation kill the tv series from hbo yeah brings me so much joy cuz like you know we talk about pieces of pop culture that are accurate to actual deployment life and i think generation kill is like spot on cuz you have that one fir- you have that one sergeant major or you know or gunny that literally just goes around and he has no job. You know, he has no job whatsoever other than to reinforce grooming standards when there's a literal war happening around him. You know, the one thing he's worried about is mustaches. You know, <laughs> police that mustache. <laughs> grooming standards. That's all he worries about. And yeah. uh, that, that's it. Like, there, you reach a point of rank. That like, you know, we all make jokes about like once you become a sergeant major, like what is your what is your job essentially? Yeah. It's yeah. just to keep people off your grass. <laughs> and like to an extent, there's you know, there's truth in in some humor, you know. Humor's yeah. there is an absolute truth in all this world. But uh but yeah, that's to me it's one hundred percent true because I remember like I was talking to one guy at Shot Show actually, he was a former SEAL. And they were talking about, you know, they used to deploy to the Philippines and they got a, I think they got a platoon from the 82nd Airborne to come to support them. And like, you know, SEALs are super relaxed. Yeah. That was one thing. Even the reserve SEALs, like I worked with the reserve guys in, in Korea and like looking at them, dude, like no discipline, you know, and that's what they're, <laughs> that's what they're known for. You, they could do whatever they want. Yeah. And uh, like they'd wear whatever they want. They could look however they want. So like I was talking to this guy and he was like big guy, big fucking seal guy. And, uh, you know, he's they're all full bearded, like literally Viking beard, and, you know, <laughs> jacked and wearing whatever. And this platoon shows up and like they're, you know, actively going out on missions in the Philippines. And they're he's like, yeah, they were really good guys. And one day, like they had, you know, their first sergeant like fly in and talk to us and he's like hey how are my guys how are my guys doing with you guys are they are they uh and instead of like wondering like how operationally they're doing like are they actually supporting the seal team the way they should be the one question he asked is are they shaving he's like are they <laughs> are they maintaining their grooming standards not are they you know being an asset to your you know actual operation he's like yeah. are they shaving <laughs> and the guy, you know, the guy's like, what the what the chief was like, what the fuck? So he goes out and he's like, uh, he talks to the rest of the 82nd guys and he's like, they were like, how did it go? And he's like, well, you want to know what he asked? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, he asked if you guys were all shaving when you're supposed to. And he's like, I'll let you know right now. I don't give a fuck about that he's like you guys can grow beards you guys can dress however you want as long as you're good and doing your job well and i'll let you know when this cocksucker comes back and i'll give you you know i'll give you like a two day a day notification so you guys can shave and look right for him and he's like yeah but like dudes like that yeah you know there yeah that's 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 important too man to have those kinds of guys that understand the difference between what it takes to do the job and kind of at least in deployment superfluous 
kind of disciplinary, but like in the rear battalion type stuff. Our, I got to hand it to our, our sergeant major when I was there up in Mosul was, uh, he would, he would cut it, but he, he'd had it both ways. So if you were in the headquarters element, I was on the B team at the time. Yeah. Uh, you're in Mosul. It's a major base. We're sharing, you know, we're going out and representing ourselves to other units. His rationale was, Hey, we got to be clean shaven, got to be to standard, you know, like we could wear civilians yeah. out when we went to the chow hall. As long as we had a sidearm, we could be relaxed in that. But if you went to go do something official at, with another unit, like you had to get some paperwork done or whatever, you wear a uniform, you go and talk to them and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you were away from Mosul and you were out in one of our little satellite fobs, um, then you could do what you want. Yeah. yeah. And day. yeah. And if, yeah, you came in, it was understood. Like he's not going to get on you for having a beard and having it grown out or wearing relaxed uniforms. But if you go out on a mission, obviously then it's there's a certain standard that he wanted you to adhere to but he was pretty cool the, the only thing i resented him for was that we weren't allowed to wear boonie caps he's like boonie caps are for panama canal that's it like that oh. <laughs> those boonie caps are for the jungle uh and so it was because it gets hot man you want that 360 degree shade we were never allowed to wear it so in resentment in in defiance of him i wore it after i got out of the military for a long oh, time man. and then i had to retire it because it was acu so oh man i will tell you a story though <laughs> Based on that, like trying to get away with something. Uh, when I was in Syria, I remember when we first got there, like all the SF guys, all the Delta guys, everybody had a beard. And like Rangers, the only people that like Rangers can grow beard, but it has to be a very special case. Uh, <laughs> and actually Rangers are Ranger Regiment was one of the most disciplined units I've ever seen. Hey. Like you will shave every day. You will be the standard. They're like, this is, you are the standard. So you will maintain <laughs> it. So like you typically you shave on deployment, unless you're part of like recce or you're going on an Omega deployment, which is like attached to CIA. Like you were not allowed to shave or you are not allowed to grow a beard. So when we got there and everybody had beards and we were like super well shaven. I was like, well, I want a fucking beard. Like I'm not going to be the only guy out here. Like looking like, Looking like a regular army guy, you know, no offense. <laughs> yeah. So I remember, I remember it's like there was, I formulated this whole plot to let myself, allow myself to grow a beard. And like, uh, I wanted one so bad because A, I've never grown one before. So I wanted to see if I could. And I wanted to blend in because like, if we're working with these guys, we're working with the SDF, like we should look like one of them. We Syria. should look like the yeah. locals. Yeah, so yeah. So like. It, like five days before the actual order came down, like we were, they wanted us shaving every day. Like our first sergeant and CEO would drive down to ours, uh, our little fob because they were staying at something called the LCMR, which was like this concrete factory, which, you know, which later we found out was funding ISIS, but that's a different story. Mm. Uh, yeah. You can look that up. The concrete factory, French concrete factory in Syria, uh, funds isis uh, uh, but we were staying there they were like letting us stay there but we were at the fob and like they'd come down and make sure we were shaving to standard and i was just like you know fuck this we i was like we're out here we, we should look like the locals we should blend in we shouldn't you know show our ass so and this I is just over, in your head this is just this is in my head your own yeah, of course. i'm not gonna i'm not <laughs> telling that to my platoon sergeant i i really respect the guy um but uh i was always kind of known to kind of do like you know, I, I always walk to the beat of my own drum, um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I went to the, I went to the med station and I'm like, Hey, I'm not fucking shaving with this water. Cause the, the water's gross. Uh, like, I'm like, dude, I'm not shaving with this water. It's going to give me a skin infection. And the last thing I need out here is to, you know, is to be combat ineffective because there's holes in my fucking face <laughs> because of the, you know, bacteria. Yeah. And they gave me a shaving profile. They're like, okay, you don't yeah. have to shave. And I like what I just remember I walked in and I handed it to my squad leader because he was re he was shaving and they're all fa shaving and I handed it to my squad leader and he just looked at me and he's like, fuck you. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, dude, don't don't hate me because you ain't me. <laughs> two days, two days after that, they came down. They're like, you guys don't have to shave. And I was like, I ah! went through I went through all this trouble. I made enemies. You don't I think made. you broke the dam? Do you think you broke the dam? Do you think you got the leak? No. Go, oh, okay. They just did it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Like I might have. I might. I don't know. They didn't tell me if I did, but uh, they wouldn't. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'll take if I'll take that credit. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. But yeah, they were kind of like this guy. You know, they were like, ah, oh, this guy. He's <laughs> trying to grow beards, but yeah, it, we all got to grow beards, and then I and then I looked Middle Eastern, so that was cool. But, uh, <laughs> 
But yeah, you want to? You want? I, I just wanted to. I I just wanted to. I I uh, full disclosure. I haven't seen War Machine with Brad Pitt, but I wanted oh, to I talk have. about it. Just just okay, good. Just a little bit because I know we give a lot of we give a lot of our our officers a hard time. But yeah, uh, especially when it came to Afghanistan, I can understand the idea of trying to get things done at a leadership level and just all of the politicking and the, the glad handing and all the just the I don't know, just the layers and layers of BS that you have to go through just to try to get something done to get something sure. implemented that, you know, that tactically might be correct, but you are under civilian leadership. And so you have that to. Down, down. Yeah, they yeah. don't know, and they don't understand. They have their own interests that they're sure. trying to fulfill. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of give give a shout out to the officers and the higher ups and stuff because I know that a lot, you know a lot of them are you know aren't worth the uh, the uniforms they wear, but some of you know a lot of a lot of them are. They've been there and they know. And I think Stanley McChrystal, I think, is kind of who this was loosely based off of. It was, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do I you mean, think about that? <sighs> It's, it's hard. Yeah, it's it's super hard because, you know, the higher like I, I think officers have the same kind of rep as like, you know. Of enlisted once they reach that level, you know, yeah. it's like it gets to the point where you're like yours, your word goes. But then, like, does it actually yeah. like right? Like the only way to be really in charge is to be the president. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because <laughs> he's the commander in chief. Yeah. And like that's there is so watching that movie. I mean, I think, you know, Brad Pitt plays a really good example. Like McChrystal, all these giant leaders that we hear about, like Merrill and McChrystal and all these, you know, legends, they ha they're infamous. You know, his routine, his, you know, prowess, his military discipline, how he conducts himself like they are. They are legends mm -hmm. like there is no, uh, you know, legend is an earned title for these guys. But at the end of the day, they're still, you know, directed by some political power that has no experience in war, that has no tactical, uh, no tactical perception or understanding. So like, it's, you can see the frustration in the movie, but like also a lot of officers that I've met with don't have a level of understanding from the enlisted side. Mm, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's a big, you, I think that's a, the universal and timeless truth when it yeah. comes to military. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of the best officers I've worked with and the ones that, you know, I enjoyed having as some of my leadership, um, were prior enlisted guys. Cause they get it. They understand, uh, you know, some of the officers that just straight up come out of RTC, haven't done any of the grunt work, haven't, you know, had that life experience, just come by and snap their fingers and think it can get done. And it's like, yeah. it doesn't work like that, sir. Yeah. You know, um, so there's that one scene in uh, War Machine when he comes out and he's talking to the Marines and he's like, you just got to he's trying to give him like the motivational speech. And he's like, <laughs> you just got to. You just got to keep hitting it because you're serving your country. And, you know, you're good. And one of the Marines was like, why are we here? <laughs> and he's like, we're here because there is an enemy out there. And he's like, yeah, but what are we doing? Like, we're not even allowed to engage these guys like the ROE. It's like, what are we? We're not fighting the terrorists. Right. Why are right. we here? And he's like, dur, dur, dur. he has like a, you know, <laughs> he, he gets like super mad because obviously he doesn't have an answer for him. Right. You know, you can't, he can't give him an answer because he's not out there, you know, kicking in the doors and doing the work. He just expects it to get done, but he doesn't know what it requires. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So like, I think War Machine's a really good <laughs> example of you just have, you know, you have brass that really, you know, some do and some don't. Uh, luckily, the leaders I had, uh, we're super cool and they all have prior, you know, prior cool guy. Yeah. Uh, little um, experiences. But, uh, you know, a lot of the conventional side, I believe, doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I Yeah. I'll, I'll give a shout out to the, the second. I think it's the second captain that came in of an ODA that I was on. Uh, uh, Phil Cornerchuk. Uh, good old Captain Cornerchuk. He was from Canada, and I think he was enlisted up there, or he was he he he, I, he was the most relaxed officer that I ever had the pleasure of serving with. Yeah, uh, he he knew he knew his place within the ODA and what his responsibilities were. Yeah, and uh, and then I think also he was just like a chill dude. I think we had some you know common interests, and he wasn't he wasn't all uppity about his rank. 
And, uh, and so that was, that was the funnest, uh, or the, you know, the, the, that was the best time I had serving with an officer as long, you know, as long as I was on the team with him. So. All right. Cool. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Nice, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, dude, I, you know, I agree with you The the, the war machine and no, having officers that like kind of know where they stand is probably the best blessing you can get as an enlisted guy. Um, that's why I liked Ranger Regiment so much because like the officers came in, they were studs. They were absolute studs. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah. they're. I mean, there are some that are like you're studs, but you're hard to work with. <laughs> you know, the ego, ego is a big thing. Yeah. But I, you know, I have to. You know, the officer world, like we talk shit about it, but like it is stressful. <laughs> Like, if you think your team leader is putting pressure on you as a private to perform, like, no, the commander is putting pressure on those platoon leaders to perform. Like, they talk to each other way harsher than anybody I've ever seen. Like, yeah. that's a rough life. And, like, they're all PT studs. They're all expected to be in shape, to be professional, to be gentlemen, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But, like, that's, it's, you know, it's a lot of pressure. Um, but, hey, you know, Cameron. Compared to, yeah. Let me ask you a question. This is like, I, I wanted to talk about this. I just wanted to throw this out there because it's something that I don't think you and I can like fully answer because who the heck knows, but here we are. It's this, we're filming this in 2024. Okay. Early 2024. Yeah. And I got the, at the, the question at the end of the, the format, if you want to look at it, but we are, as of right now, we're not anywhere majorly, right? We're not in Afghanistan yeah. anymore. We're not in Iraq anymore. Uh, I'm sure we're around. There's little, you know, I'm sure SF's still doing their uh, relationship to style deployments to different countries around the world to maintain our relationships. I know that's what my guys would be doing, um, trying to maintain that readiness. I'm sure Rangers are doing the same kind of things. But uh, yep. what do you think warfare is going to look like for America specifically in the future? Do you have any predictions? Any thoughts predictions? on that? Not yeah, maybe <laughs> predictions. Let me consult my my glowing orb over here. <laughs> Your eight magic eight ball. Yeah, um, it's it's a great question, man, I, and I think it is like the question on everyone's mind. Yeah. Um, I by no means am like a war specialist. You know, I just am a guy that served, did his time, got out, and you know can't get over it. Yep. Um, but uh, <laughs> but there i think there's a lot of things that are going to be changing about warfare because we have the technology side um i'm a firm believer that the military nowadays are stronger faster and smarter than us than our days like they need even your days even just a few even my days ago. i think oh, okay. i think the rangers nowadays are way smarter and stronger than i was hey you know so and i, I and i'm glad <laughs> <You know? laughs> i'm so glad i'm not like one of those salty guys that was like my day was harder and i was tougher it's like no i want you to be way smarter tougher and you know because you're how you're gonna have harder wars to fight yeah um because i think like the implications that come with you know incorporating technology uh new equipments to understand to combat other technology like did you ever use drones Nope. Like handheld drone. Like that's a thing. Like they're nope. doing that now. Like they have yeah. drones within platoons and you know, they have all these different technologies. Like you didn't have the ATAC, right? With nope. the phones mounted on the chest. Like that's nope. standard. That's Blue standard. Force tracker, baby. Yeah. Yeah. So like Blue Force Tracker, that's a, that you need to carry that in a truck. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, now man. you essentially have that on your chest. Yeah. And like, so we're getting more advanced, but that technology requires not just one person to know how to use it, but it requires everybody to know how to use it. You yeah. Know? That's good point. Uh, yeah so like you're gonna they're gonna have to be smarter they're gonna have to be stronger because they're you know obviously they're getting equipment to assist them but it's all technical base plus you know that the the physical demands of war aren't going to change uh so and just and the, when i say they're going to be stronger it's just because the discoveries of you know science and you know i know when i was in we had like physical therapists and all these guys and training yeah. and coaches and you didn't have that no and no like way. see so that's like if i had that now what do they have now you know yeah. almost five six years yeah six years later like i'm sure they have way more and it's more involved so they're going to be stronger they're going to be healthier they're going to be smarter yeah um so i think you know i think it's going to be more of a technology uh, technology and a data war uh, but you're always going to need boots on the ground. That is not going to change. Like, even yeah. if you find these guys, somebody's going to have to get them. Yeah. The last hundred meters belongs to the infantry. 
Exactly. So yeah. I don't think that's ever going to change. Plus, you know, we're living in 2024 and we look at Russia and Ukraine, like you mentioned in the beginning. Like they're fighting in trenches. Yeah. You know, like yeah. we didn't do that since World War One. So war is going to advance and also regress at the same time. Yeah. So we're going to see a lot of these things that they did back in the day. But like, uh, but yeah, no, I, you know, the, the world is a very unpredictable place just because nobody, I mean, obviously we've been for Israel and Palestine have been fighting for a millennia since their existence. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Middle East is always going to be the Middle East. Yeah. And I, I, you know, as far as America's involvement, uh, involvement, I think we're really close, but I'm not like a crazy prepper. I think we're going to have little sporadic events that are going to unfold. Uh, but as far as like full fledged world war three, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you, Iran. I got your fucking number. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it's a good question. A lot of people are focused on China. We have a lot of Houthi terrorist group involvement with, uh, you know, Iran backed proxy cells in the yeah. Middle East and Syria and Iraq. Yep. So like I said, there's little conflicts every now and then. I don't see like the U.S. mobilizing in force for one specific place, you know, uh, anytime soon. Uh, but, you know, I could I could be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty. Uh, that's a pretty well-rounded answer, man. I appreciate that. I, I kind of, uh, the, in a, my short version is, I basically agree with what you're talking about because America, by virtue of our size, location, our economic, I think con being connected economically, I don't think it behooves any other country, any large power, to attack us directly. I yeah. think it's going to be. I think World War Three. Maybe you could even say World War Three is being fought right now. It's being fought technologically, economically, and culturally. Yeah. Right. America, I don't think America is ever going to get invaded by a massive army, kind of Red Dawn no. style. I think if and if if America is being attacked, it's going to be attacked culturally, economically, scientifically, uh, you know, psychologically, technologically, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And and like you say, we, we may commit troops in, to some degree or another in certain areas. I think more so now we're kind of in supporting it's we're back to the cold war essentially where these poor countries are going to be basically our proxies for other superpowers that are trying to influence them but yeah. we're trying to influence them so we're going to support these guys and they're yeah, going to support turf. those guys it's a turf war yeah turf war on a global yeah. scale i'd rather hear both yeah sides. exactly yeah um, i mean if we were to be a, i mean final thought on that one if we were to be attacked like it wouldn't be full-scale invasion like you said i think it would be like smaller attacks within within domestically because like the border crisis right now is really right <laughs> yeah so you got bad. an inordinately oh, large amount God. of chinese uh, Chinese uh, military, military age males, males coming across entering the, border. the country hmm, yeah interesting that's that super interesting yeah. yeah and it's like okay well you know that's really scary to think about um that like, like that's a big issue because like you know if you can't get into our systems our technological systems from overseas you can you know if you can get the wi-fi connection i'm sure you can do a lot yeah uh so you know having that you know open border right now and not doing a thing about it is extremely concerning yeah um yeah. but uh yeah it's i mean i don't want to say i'm excited to see what happens because i'm not at all but uh i am prepared to see what happens. Interesting times we live in, Cameron. Interesting, Interesting times. times indeed, Izzy. Now That's cool, man. By the way, before we jump into our game, which I have right here in front of me, I want to do a little self shout out. I did an episode of the Green Beret Chronicles with uh Yeah. Yeah, with Jay Dorleas, a super cool dude, former Green Beret. He's got a podcast and a YouTube channel. If you want to go check it out, the Green Beret Chronicles. Uh I, I got an episode on there. I did it while we were at shot show before i got sick yeah but uh a lot of fun i talk about my life my my time in selection uh shift fire afterward you know shift fire and gameology afterwards my career uh, as it's been since i left the army so it kind of go through like a nice little biographical thing it was good jay's a good dude and and he uh has a great vision for the podcast where he wants to uh, focus on bringing the story of the Green Berets to the front line, to the popular culture, so that they can inspire the next generation of people who are thinking about maybe joining up as well. Nice, man. Yeah, I've seen a couple of his stuff pop up on my algorithm. Uh oh. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> it's whatever you're doing is working. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool, man. Okay. So now, Cameron, we have a game, and I'm very excited to bring it to you. Chris made this one up. It's called. Uh, it goes like this. Deployment. It can be very lengthy. 
In honor of that, a very special and an especially difficult game has been cooked up for you. Great. This game is called How Long Was the War? I'll give oh, you the name yes. of a war and you tell me how long it lasted within. I'm going to he he give he gave me a little bit of leeway, so I'm going to give you a couple of years on either side. Uh, if you get if if I feel like you made a good effort and got pretty close, I'll uh, I'll give it to you. But yeah, watch him put the hundred years war in there <laughs> because I know it didn't last a hundred years. <laughs> so all right, well, it's only one way to find out. This is your warm up. So how long did this war last? You got to give me a number of years that it lasted. The American Civil War. Civil War. Oh, American man. Civil War. Yeah. American Civil War. Didn't it? It wasn't that long of a war. Um, the official war. Oh, shit. Here we go. Now I'm just going to fucking. I always say I love history. And then I think about dates and I get cross-eyed. <laughs> didn't it last like. Uh, it didn't last that long. I think it lasted like six years. Six years. Final answer. I'm going to give it to you. It lasted four years, four years, four one years. month and two weeks to be exact. But four okay. years you got within a couple of years. I'll give it to you. Man. OK, what was that? 18. Ooh, brother. Yeah. Something. Oh, it doesn't have the actual dates. It just no. Says it, yeah, it doesn't. Not on here. But obviously you John Johnny G could look it up for us. Yeah, Johnny. G. Uh, 1861 to 65. There okay. you go. I knew that 1865 was in there somewhere. So 1861 to 65. Okay, that was your warm up. This is your first official question. Here we go. The Vietnam War. At least Vietnam. America America's involvement a very, very specifically. Okay. So think about okay. all the Vietnam wars that are out war movies that are out there. How okay, long? So I know <laughs> We get the Vietnam was longer, but I think did we get there in 68? 68 or 69? 68. I know we got out. I think it was like 74 we got out. I think it was six years long. I'm gonna say 68 to 74. Ooh, Cam, and I cannot give this one to you because remember we were soldiers. Remember was that Mel earlier? Gibson, so that was nineteen fifty five. That's oh 55 to 75. Okay, 20 something. 20 years. 20 years. Wow. Okay. Why did I think? Okay. I mean, because remember, I think the French were all up in there they first. They were there, yeah. And then we started getting involved for whatever reason. 55 to 75. Wow. 20 years. Huh? Long time, man. Long time. Long yeah. time. Wow. Okay. You, it's funny. You watch 80s movies and you, you realize how many people, how many actors or people in the industry that got out, got into the entertainment industry. You're like, oh, that guy's a Vietnam vet. That guy's a Vietnam vet. Yeah, 20 years, uh, man. That's yeah, crazy. 20, long time. Yeah. Just like Afghanistan. So. Yeah, literally think about like, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to look back and like, G Watt's going to be like, all right, uh, Vietnam. Right. Yeah. 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 They're going to be like, that lasted 20 years? Wow. Right. Right. Next one coming up, Cameron. The Iraq War. Ooh, the Iraq War. That was the G-Watt. short. Um, like the actual, the invasion? The Iraqi war. No, no, like, no. The 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 war when we officially kind of like say, hey, we're, we're going major operations or something. From when to when? Major operation. Oh, that, this is. I feel like I might be tricking myself because obviously we've been in, like Iraq was part of the GWAP, but then we had the invasion of Iraq, which was two thousand two thousand three. Okay. Was it 2000 or was it 2006? See, I'm getting my dates backwards now because we had an invasion of Iraq. We had an invasion of Afghanistan, the first push in Afghanistan. Which one came first? I'm blanking. I think. Oh. I don't think it's that long. I think okay. it's a, a year. Are you are we thinking of the same war? The Iraq war? <laughs> The Iraq War, not the end of the Persian uh, Gulf War, or not the okay. Of, see, that was the invasion of not Jarhead. Yeah, Persian Gulf War is when Kuwait, Saddam Hussein, 91, 92. Yeah, 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 91, yeah. 92. That was Desert Storm. Yeah, this is post 9 11. Post 9 11. So, was this the 2006 one? I think you might be thinking about it a little too hard. I think I am thinking about it way too hard. I don't know. I'm just going to throw a number out there that's okay. probably wrong. Three years. That is incorrect. You are right in that is in that it is incorrect. It's eight years, 2003 to 2011. 2003. We to invaded. I remember I was in Colorado hanging out with my buddy's place. And we were snowed in, 
And so I couldn't go anywhere. So all we did was watch footage about the Iraq war invasion or the Iraq invasion in 2003. But yeah, uh, to 2011, that's when we kind of majorly the major drawdown, at least. And then I and then and then ISIS came back and then we had to support, you know, them again. Yeah, so like when did that? Yeah. When did that war officially? Because we like my platoon went to Iraq. I was in Ranger School when they went to Iraq. And I was like, right. hey, when did this officially end? Pretty sure we still have troops in Iraq. I think we do like advisory. Yeah. We have small base yeah. support, okay. whatever. But huh. uh, yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, let's keep moving. Cause you're not doing very well. World War One. <laughs> World War One was kind of lengthy. Uh, okay, so I think it twenties or thirties. Think of recent movies that have come out. Yeah, I am thinking of it, but I don't remember the dates on them. You kidding me? Well, there's li- there's a movie that's literally a year. 1940. Yeah, I know. 1930. What is it called again? 19. 19- I'm just <laughs> I, 1917. Is it okay? 19... Okay. okay, let's start. Sorry. Let's start with that. Okay, 1917. We have the troops fleeing. Germans invade. God, this is killing me. <laughs> but that wasn't the be- was 1917 the beginning of the war? No, it wasn't the begin. Was it the beginning? I'm just gonna say ten years. Okay, you're wrong. <laughs> it was four years, 1914 to 1918. It was one of those, World War One was one of those things where they didn't think it was going to last very long, and then it ended up lasting years more after that. Okay. Um, it was kind of a weird kind of thing, but yeah, by 1917, we were very well into the thick of it, and then I think 1918 was when it finally, when it finally okay. ended. I don't even know, I don't even know the circumstances surrounding it ending like what happened like do we have a major defeat or do we have like a major victory against the kaiser we have a treaty yeah do we right. have a treaty because i know i think there was a treaty uh, i think there was a treaty was it the versailles treaty of versailles or was that no that was pre- that was really leading up to world war ii because um or maybe it was a versailles treaty anyway be um because I know, I think that World War Armistice, the, the armistice. armistice of November 18th. Yeah, because they got Armistice Day over there in the UK, right? Maybe, uh, I don't know. Because the events of World War II were seeded, the seeds were planted in the aftermath of World War One. because I think there was a lot of resentment in Germany and Hitler utilized that and kind of like, we're going to be a nation again because they took away territory from Germany and they're like, we're going to get it back because that's our territory. Anyway, yeah, yeah. then invasion of Poland, yeah. invasion of Poland. There you go. The Versailles Treaty, yeah. I think, was when he said peace in our time, and it was totally a lie. Hitler totally yeah. backstabbed him. He's like, "No, I'm going to invade Poland." Anyway, yeah. let's okay. move on. I need to brush up on my history. That's all right. I mean, years are hard to do, man. I'm not going to. I'm not going to ding you for this one. Nobody, nobody is blaming you, Cameron. That's okay. 18, War of 1812. The War of 1812. Wonderful. This How many lasted. Years did it last? The War of 1812. I'm assuming this is just one year because it is the War of 1812. I mean, I'm gonna it's get at literal. least one. It's at least, it's at one. least one. The War of 1812. This was before the Civil War. Uh, I'm going to say this was a three-year war. That is exactly right, Cameron. Good for you. Yep. Nice. Uh, 1812 yep. to 1815, two years and eight months to be exact. We rounded up for the yep. sake of simplicity. All right, Cameron. Next one. You wanted it. You got it. The hundred years, years war. <laughs> was it? But the question is, Israel, was it shorter? Did we round up longer? or did we round down? Yeah. When we titled this war. Yep. This was a fun fact. We've talked about it before, but we have a talked long about time it. ago. A long time ago. I don't even remember what we talked about because I'm looking at the answer and I'm like, I don't. That does not look familiar to me. So. Really. For some reason, the the number one hundred and fourteen, like it was over a hundred, it was over a hundred years. That's like, well, I'll I'll talk about it afterwards. I don't. Uh, my comment would give it away. I'm just gonna say I'm gonna I'm gonna you know I'm, I'm second guessing myself, so I'm gonna say it lasted ninety two years. So it wasn't like a hundred years. Ooh, I can't quite give it to you because it did last over a hundred years. It was one hundred and sixteen oh, years from thirteen thirty seven to fourteen fifty three. That's, I was going to say, my comment was, that's three generations worth of people. Like, you could be born, live your life, and die, and your country is still at war. Nothing yeah. has changed. 
That's yeah, pretty crazy. back then too. Back then it was like what was it? The Maybe average, it was like five like generations. Yeah, yeah. It was like yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. When when did that happen? The hundred year that was like in the seventeen hundreds, right? No, no, thirteen thirty seven to fourteen fifty three. Shit. Yeah. Oh, do we have muskets back then? Do we have? Uh, the introduction of black powder was in the thirteen hundreds to Europe, so I think they did. Okay. All right. Um. All right. Last mm -hmm. one, Cameron. Let's finish out this long slog of a game. Yeah. The, the French Revolution. French Revolution. French Revolution. How many uh, years well, did didn't that last? Uh, so the French Revolution was French Revolution. That was that Napoleon was in the French Revolution. No, um, I mean the Napoleonic Wars would be that's if we're gonna characterize it like GWAT style. The Napoleonic Wars would be that. I think that was way before. I'm not looking at the answer, but I think that was way before because Napoleon, like that was still like royalty years, you know. And the French Revolution was like we're gonna have, I guess, democracy now. I guess I don't know. Oh, really? Oh, shit. See, I know nothing about France. Apologies to all our French them. friends. Yeah, all our French friends. I'm sorry. French just, Mike, I'm sorry. I don't know your history. Yeah, I just don't care about it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that lasted 12 years. I'm going to give it to you, Cameron. It was 10 years. 10 17, years. 1789 to 1799. 10 years, the French Revolution. Okay, I'll take Long it. Long Revolution. I, it is, yeah, it's, they're revolting. We got ours done in about, uh, what, two, three years? We declared, yeah. then they came over, and it was kind yeah. of a, it was kind of 1776. Cat and mouse for, a, for a long time, yeah. Yeah. And then like 1780, 17, well, maybe it was longer than that. Now I have to look it up. Yeah. Until 1776. when, though? 1776, American Revolution. Uh, yeah, 1765 to 1783. Oh, okay, so it was a build up. All out yeah. war, and then we finally turned Let's the tide. Okay. Explain. Almost in 1775, 1776, we kicked all the British pretty much out. Yeah. Well, Cameron, that's it. That's the game. You didn't do that very was a well, hard game. Hopefully yeah. you learned a lot. I got dude, dude, when it comes to numbers, it's hard, man. Who cares about numbers? What are even <laughs> numbers? I'm a letter guy. Okay. Yeah, you want, I prefer you want letters. Words become a mathematician. Okay. Exactly. You want, you yeah. want numbers? Whatever. <laughs> yeah well folks i hope you did better on that game than i did but i also hope you had a great time listening to izzy and i talk about our deployment experiences and some pieces of pop culture that aligned with them if you did make sure you are subscribing to our youtube channel uh, also if you're interested in more content from us we have some exclusive content on our patreon page and we also have a merch store that you can check out if you want to rock some pcfm apparel or get some stickers to slap on your grandmother's forehead um other than that izzy you got anything Folks, let us know if you, I know we're coming to the end of it, nobody listens to these, but hey, you let us know if you want us to get back into video game reviews because I would like to, and I got a few ideas up my sleeve. So if you think that would be good, you just let us know. Leave a comment on the YouTube, on this episode's channel, uh, send us a DM on Instagram, but uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for the future of the channel. Good to see Absolutely. you. Absolutely. That being said, All right. cue music. Cue music.